dust on your ceiling fan. It's a little annoying. And dust on your bookshelf? Well, I don't know about you, but I can't stand it. But that doesn't compare to dust on the moon and on Mars. Called regolith, this stuff is so dangerous that without the proper precautions, it can cause a mission to, well, bite the dust. <laughs> Cheers. All right, so tonight I'm drinking bear lasers. Like, it's, it's called bear lasers. Kind of a citrusy IPA. This comes in pint cans, that's a plus for me. Dust on the moon has been a well-known problem for decades. During the first moon missions, lunar dust proved hard to clean, was an irritant to the astronauts, and was just about impossible to work with. Fortunately, the landers used for those missions were small. There was no other infrastructure on the moon, and none of those missions experienced failure due to that dust. Yet some scientists, including myself, consider it one of the major problems, even more of a problem than radiation when it comes to our efforts to colonize the moon and Mars in the near future. But before we get too deep into that, let's get dirty and talk about the dust itself. Here on Earth, we're no strangers to dust. The stuff that you find clinging to your ceiling fans or worse, on your bookshelves is little more than a nuisance to us in day-to-day -day life. Dust on Earth is usually composed of small amounts of plant pollen, human or animal hairs, textile or paper fibers, materials from outdoor soil, human skin cells, sometimes burnt out meteorite particles, and many other materials that are found in your local natural environment. Well, dust on the moon is different than anything you'd find here on Earth, even in the most barren and inhospitable places like the Sahara Desert or Phoenix, Arizona. Some of the lunar surface is made up of silica or volcanic glass, created during asteroid impacts or ancient volcanic activity respectively. Plagioclase also makes up a significant portion of the dust. A classifier for feldspar materials with various mineral characteristics, plagioclases, plagioclases, cla plagioclasi, plagioclases, plagioclases, yeah, whatever, are various crystalline compounds composed of silica, calcium, and sodium, among other things. And finally, agglutinates, which are clumps of material that cohesively bind together. This term is usually used here on Earth to describe things like blood clots in microbiology, but when you're talking about dust, this stuff can only be found in the moon, at least so far. This makes up as much as 70% of the lunar surface in some places. It's reasonable to assume that it's common on bodies with low gravity and little or no atmospheres. So it's made of different stuff than we find here on Earth, and okay, so what? Well, the real problem is that it's sharper than an international mathematical Olympiad winner, which, by the way, starts on July 8th. Even if dust on Earth were composed of the exact same things we find on the moon, it would be rounded and eroded through eons of exposure to rain, wind, oxidation, and other natural surface phenomena. On the moon, you don't really have rain or wind or anything that can erode these particles, so they're really sharp and jagged along the edges. That's one of the reasons why it's so abrasive and why it was such an irritant to astronauts during the Apollo era. In addition to that, with little or no gravity and no air, electrostatic forces dominate, which means this grainy, abrasive stuff sticks to everything. It'll get into machines, it'll clog up filters, and it's almost impossible to get off. That's why NASA is now opting for suit ports instead of the airlocks that we used during the Apollo era to minimize how much dust can actually get inside the habitable volume. But that's only half the issue. The other part of that is the high velocity dust created by thruster plumes on the lunar landers during their descent to the lunar surface. Now this stuff moves fast. We're talking crazy fast. Thousands of meters per second, enough to leave the surface of the moon and never come back. This high velocity dust could sandblast lunar or even orbital infrastructures leading to power outages, pressure leaks, or other kinds of failures. More details on that will be released in August in a paper I'm working on for the Astronomic Specialist Conference. And that's right, I'm shamelessly self-promoting an academic paper on a YouTube channel. Dust on Mars, however, is a different issue. Although having the benefit of being exposed to a dynamic climate with many seasons, it is notoriously problematic. It clings to surfaces and causes more mechanical problems than we can drive in a Jaguar. Oh, son of a bitch. This Martian dust was what killed the Spirit and Opportunity rovers because it covered its solar panels to the point where it couldn't even get enough power to function. But there's a more nefarious nature to Martian dust that its lunar counterpart simply can't compete with. And that is that it's toxic to humans, to animals, and to plants. 
It contains 0.5% perchlorate compounds that, when exposed to oxygen, releases dangerous amounts of chlorine into the air, which could kill astronauts in a matter of weeks if not less, depending on dose. It's so fine that no amount of modern filtration and air purification used in space systems could eliminate it, and thus, new ways of dealing with this challenge must be developed. Now, this is bad news for colonization efforts. Even if we manage to clean the air of chlorine, we must deal with the issue of the plants we bring with us. Not only will we have to bring our own plants to grow food during our two-year trip to Mars, but our own soil as well. Even mixing Martian soil with our own, such as you saw in the Martian, would result in a reduction in the amount of chlorophyll in the plants that are already much further away from the sun than they are in their natural environment. Even if we fix the issue with more artificial lights, we'd run into the problem that this perchlorate compound stunts the growth of these plants both above ground and in the soil, meaning that we'd get less crop yield per square meter than we would without it. So that means we would need more plants, which require more space and more soil, and ultimately leads to more cost, unless we can find a way to purify this regolith before we even get to Mars. That's one reason why the Mars sample return mission currently under development at JPL is so important to our future colonization efforts to understand how we can deal with this toxic soil issue. Sorry, Elon, but rushing off to the moon without doing your proper research, well, it's a suicide mission. Other solar system bodies are likely to host their own variety of problems when it comes to space dust. Europa, a moon of Jupiter, or Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, are likely to have tiny, numerous, and razor-sharp ice crystals, while volatile surface chemicals on Titan or even Pluto may make for an especially dangerous landing environment and a potentially explosive combination when exposed to the pressurized, warm, and oxygen-rich environments inside habitation elements. Thus, Mars is far from the last dusty hurdle astronauts will face as we push into deeper destinations within our solar system. All right, so what can we do about it? Well, NASA, at least for the Artemis program, has a few tricks up its sleeves to dealing with lunar dust and perhaps Martian dust as well. One of my jobs at NASA is to look at the development of landing pads on the moon. The dust on the surface itself could be used to print a landing pad, or maybe we could bring one with us. Either way, having a landing pad to prevent the spread of that high-velocity dust we talked about earlier is an absolute necessity for the safety of astronauts and equipment on the moon, especially if we're going to make a habitat there. Regarding the cleaning nature of dust, scientists here at Kennedy Space Center Swamp Works have already pioneered methods of using the same electrostatic properties of dust as a way of cleaning suits and equipment. Additionally, we can minimize how often and how many things we bring in from outside that have been exposed to that lunar dust. And finally, the last solution is one of infrastructure and organization. Yeah, it's a little bit less tangible and sci-fi than the ones we described earlier, but they're still just as important. By controlling where, when, and how we land on and interact with the lunar surface, we can better understand where and how the dust will spread and how we can prevent damage to our systems. But we'll have more on that next year as that's a paper for another conference. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Scientific Drinking. Tune in next time where we talk about consciousness. Cheers.